Hello, my friends. So this is a glorious day. It is a truly, truly glorious occasion because someone has finally made a, a real effort at responding to one of my videos. Okay, so calling it a real effort might be giving them a bit too much credit, but I don't really care. I'm just so excited here because I don't usually get video responses. Seems that most people are too intimidated to even try, so I'm just happy that someone's given it a go, finally. So to celebrate this momentous occasion, I'm going to respond to their response. Naturally. Now, I've pre-watched it and I've decided pretty conclusively it's not the sort of response that really requires me to go back and do new research or write a, write a script or anything because the creator doesn't really counter any of my arguments he doesn't really provide counter evidence he basically just sort of talks really smugly and ignores the vast majority of my video to selectively choose parts of it to respond to which i'm not going to do to him i'm going to show his entire video as i respond to it part by part so yeah, just a bit of courtesy for you, my friend. So he's responding to my video on the um, Holodomor genocide question, which is the historical debate as to whether or not the Holodomor constitutes a genocide. And my video was framed as a response to the Wikipedia article on the topic at the time. So he begins his video by fundamentally agreeing with what I say at the beginning of my video, which is like a six to seven minute short sort of explanation on why you should be sort of skeptical of Wikipedia when it's dealing with like a topic of any sort of political contention. So I'm going to skip the part where you're disagreeing with me and get to the first part where he disagrees with me. And from there, I'm going to show every little part of his video and respond bit by bit to everything that he says, which is how you do a real thorough counter argument. Take notes. So let's begin. Here's the first part where he has a bit of contention with my Holodomor video. The reasoning he uses to debunk the article is very similar to the flawed irrelevant reasoning that Wikipedia uses to decide what is and what isn't a reliable source, in that he makes several arguments against the side claiming it was a genocide that have nothing to do with whether or not it was a genocide, and little to do with the actual data itself. There are a lot of pedantic arguments he presents in his hour and a half, so I will just focus on the ones that stand out the most. But for the most part, I found his video to be guilty of something I like to call source midwittery, which is when a scholar's analysis that is being used as a source is getting judged based on some random irrelevant nitpicks. For example, he explains why countries recognizing the Holodomor as a genocide doesn't automatically make it a genocide because governments tend to just adopt what truth is convenient to them regardless of evidence. Now, to be fair, this is somewhat half true. There are some lies governments can get away with telling and some that they can't, and they usually do tend to say the things that benefit them the most. But that's a completely different topic altogether. Together. Rather, this reasoning becomes a problem because he argues that the Ukrainian government calling it a genocide can't be taken seriously, but for some reason scholars who cite Soviet state propaganda should be taken seriously. And this is just a general problem you often see with commie logic. If the source is data from a socialist state, then it is to be accepted without question, but if the source comes from a non-socialist state, then it's evil imperious Nazi propaganda or something. This is one of the many reasons why talking to communists often feels like you're talking to a wall. I just want to interject here. Which scholars are you talking about exactly? who take commie Soviet propaganda at face value. Could you name them? Because you don't seem to actually provide an example for your claim here. One of the things that I do, and that I think anyone should do, is provide an, an actual example when they claim something. If I am supposedly citing scholars who just take Soviet commie propaganda or whatever at face value, I would expect you to say, for example, he did that here with this scholar who took this propaganda at face value. You don't seem to do that. You just seem to make a claim and sort of assert that with no evidence whatsoever. You should work on that a little bit, I would say. Let's all improve the quality of this side of YouTube together by not just stating things that we back up with nothing. Anyway, so this next part is um, quite funny. Honestly, I'll let him finish here. And it also leads to some really irrelevant statements like this one. Chances of governments on matters like these have far more to do with whatever's most politically convenient for them than with them honestly assessing the historical evidence, so they're not exactly reliable sources. For a particularly illustrative example of this, in 2003 and 2008, the Australian Parliament formally passed a resolution recognising the Holodomor as genocide. Yet it's also never actually formally acknowledged its own genocide of Aboriginal people, which there is an overwhelming scholarly consensus supporting. And Australia even rejected the results of a report which the government itself commissioned, which also came to the same conclusion. 
Okay, so what? So Evil Empire number one supposedly did a bad thing, therefore bad thing by Evil Empire number two either didn't happen or doesn't count, or is somehow less evil because you use the UN definition of genocide instead of the Oxford Dictionary definition or that other definition or some other definition. For instance, he cites the alleged Australian genocide of indigenous people. Whether or not you agree if that was also wrong, what does it matter? It's completely irrelevant. Does it make Stalin starving out the Ukrainians any less evil? No. No, it does not. It is completely irrelevant. It is a meaningless tukokwi. The only thing that matters here is whether or not it can be proven that Stalin intentionally caused the death of millions. Now, I honestly am flabbergasted at, at this. I, I, I don't know. I feel like this is the sort of reaction that you would have if you simply don't understand what a counterargument is because you don't know how to, how to make one, which his counterargument to me here kind of demonstrates. Okay, so let me explain this to you pretty simply. So... My video is a counter-argument to the um, Wikipedia article on the Holodomor genocide question as it was at the time when I made it. I understand it's been changed since, I don't really know how, but that's what my video is. So, when the Wikipedia article on that subject begins by citing, as if they are some sort of authority, the governments of 14, 15, whatever it was, different countries who acknowledge the Holodomor as a genocide, well then it makes sense for me to respond to that with a counter-argument explaining why these countries acknowledging the Holodomor as a genocide doesn't actually matter at all for the question of whether or not it was a genocide. Because whether it is a genocide or not is something that is going to be determined for analysis of the facts, not through pointing to the say-so of X or Y government. Let me explain to you what I actually did here. I explained why it is irrelevant to the question to cite the opinions of these governments on the issue, which is that governments are obviously political actors who make decisions based on political concerns rather than based on facts most of the time. And then to illustrate my point, because this is something that you should be doing. I singled out one of those governments, in this case the Australian one, because I'm an Australian, and I examined their position on the issue to illustrate what I mean with my point here, by pointing out the fact that, for example, they do not acknowledge the Australian genocide of Aboriginal people, because it's obviously not politically expedient for them to do so, because for one, that would open a whole can of worms for them legally. Whereas on the other hand, it is politically convenient for them to acknowledge the Holodomor as a genocide for a number of reasons. For example, their political alignment with the Western Bloc, which Russia is a geopolitical rival of, and Russia is pretty well known for not liking that position very much. And he goes on to sort of accuse me of making the argument here that the Holodomor is not a genocide because the Australian government said so and the Australian government is bad. No, that's not the argument that I was making. I'm making a counter-argument to this article, which is citing the opinions of these governments as if they matter at all. And I'm explaining with an illustrative example why they don't. So I am certainly not doing the, um, the too coke logical fallacy where I have avoided having to engage with criticism by turning it back on the accuser you have answer criticism with criticism. Especially given that this is like the first 10 minutes of my video and there's 50 minutes of my video where I explicitly engage with both sides of the argument in the academic sphere of whether the Holodomor was a genocide or not. So, um... This is completely nonsensical. He seems to think that what I'm saying here is that Australia says it's a genocide and Australia is bad, therefore it's not a genocide, when that's not what I was saying at all. I was just making a counter-argument to this article, which was using the Australian government as one of its supposed authoritative sources, which say that the Holodomor was a genocide, and explaining why that is wrong. So we haven't really gotten off to a good start here. This guy does not seem to have very, very solid skills of basic deduction and reasoning. But um, let's continue and, and see where he takes this. And of course, the next problem is being nitpicky about definitions. For instance, take a look at this clip. Since the most common definition of genocide, using the UN definition, requires specific intent, he agrees with some other authors that bad policy that didn't turn out the way those implementing it had hoped cannot be considered genocidal by this common definition. He goes on to state that while by his assessment Stalin's actions once the famine was underway, such as instituting a policy to turn back starving peasants fleeing the affected areas, do constitute crimes against humanity, there is nonetheless just not any evidence fitting of the UN definition of genocide for the same reason that we just went over. Elman, however, does believe that there is evidence that the Soviet leadership considered some of the famine's victims to have deserved their fate. Now, I just want to, like, address this epic meme that he puts on the screen here that also just so happens to blot out the source. Can you please explain what the fuck you 
this is even about? Where did I say that it never happened for one? Because clearly the famine happened and millions of people died. And where did I say they deserved it for two? And how is this relevant to what's actually being said? Because what I'm doing here is merely summarizing um, what Michael Ellman, who actually does, by the way, think that the Holodomor was a genocide, said on the topic. So what in the holy fuck is this about? Do you just like have a meme folder and you can't help yourself from using them? like as much as possible, even in even in cases where it makes no sense whatsoever. This is absolutely baffling. Like what I'm saying at this point of the video isn't even my own opinion. It's not even my own argument. I'm summarizing the argument of a scholar on the topic. You don't seem to understand that at all. And he actually at least partly agrees with your position, yet you seem to be accusing him of believing that it never happened and they deserved it. What, dude, what the fuck are you saying? He's citing what some members of the Soviet leadership thought there, not his own opinion. How on earth could you listen to my summary of what he's saying there and then think that he's agreeing with them? And this is really just an example of the source itself not being well reasoned out. He mentions that UN definition, so let's take a look at just what the UN considers to be a genocide. Now, the main thing the UN has is a requirement for a specific intent to be found that they actually intended to commit a genocide. Then a PDF detailing the genocide convention that the genocide definition is made up of two elements, the physical element or the acts committed, and the mental element, the intent. That to constitute genocide, there must be a proven intent on the part of the perpetrators to physically destroy a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And well, the thing is, what Stalin did does indeed fit this definition. While it's true that there's no evidence of Stalin literally saying, yes, I want millions of Ukrainians to die by my actions, this sets an extremely unreasonable standard. Imagine if in a murder trial you have evidence that the defendant pulled the trigger and had a motive to murder the victim, but a lawyer tried to argue, hmm, well, gee, we can't read my client's mind and prove that he knew pulling the trigger could end the victim's life, so it was actually manslaughter. That's basically the low-level reasoning we are dealing with here. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that is determined, not for you saying imagine and coming up with a hypothetical and being like, come on, I don't like this standard, because the UN definition in this word specific intent or special intent, as it is also often called, are legal concepts. They're legal concepts that have been actually tested and tried in courts, we have precedents regarding them and stuff like that. If you had actually understood my video to any reasonable degree, you would have seen that Michael Elman actually continues in a part that you cut off for some reason. Elman cites a precedent that was set at the Rwanda Genocide Tribunal, which stated that authorities could be found culpable of the crime of genocide if they knew or should have known what the consequence of their actions would mean for a specific ethnic group. Now, the actual issue with Elman's argument here and the affirmative for the Holodomor genocide question in general is there is no proof of specific intent regarding the targeting specifically of Ukrainians. That is to say, measures were taken against peasants for being peasants, whether they were Russian, Kazakh, Ukrainian, or any other nationality, rather than against Ukrainians for being Ukrainians. This sort of question is absolutely crucial to whether something is a genocide or not. Of course, if you're not actually using the legal definition, then you can just sort of call whatever you want a genocide. And I mean, more power to you if you want to do that, but I can't really argue against that. We need to agree on terms here. We need to agree on the sort of field that we're playing on. So if you want to say, well, lots of people died, so it just, it's just a genocide for that reason. Well, okay, that's fine but um, that's unfalsifiable. So you can make an actual falsifiable argument, like according to the legal standard of genocide, it was a genocide because X, Y, and Z. Or you can just say, well, I think it should be a genocide because lots of Ukrainians died. The first argument can be reasonably responded to. The second obviously can't. And the second is pretty much what your argument is here. And regardless, his example here, his sort of hypothetical is a ridiculous caricature because no one who has any sort of familiarity with law really anywhere is going to think that intent can only be inferred from like statements like, oh, I want to kill all these people because I hate them for their ethnicity or whatever. No, obviously intent can also be inferred from actions. The problem with doing that in this case specifically is that there are plenty of scholars who have examined the evidence and concluded that actions were not taken against Ukrainians simply because they were Ukrainians. And that is a crucial point because that's the defining factor of genocide. Acts carry out against a group specifically for that quality of being from that group. And this is why, for example, yeah, I'm going to provide an example. You seem to get a bit confused when people do this, so I'm sorry if this um, confuses you a little bit here. The Cambodian genocide, as you know it, as I know it, was the killings of about 2 million people in Cambodia. Did you know that at trial, prosecutors didn't even try to try that? as genocide. The prosecutors didn't believe that they could land convictions because most of them were just ethnic Khmer people killing other ethnic Khmer people, and their motive was clearly not to wipe out their own ethnic group. So yes, the question of intent to 
attack this specific ethnic group or national group or whatever for that specific quality is absolutely core to the question of genocide. And that's a question that is at play here. It does not require a specific document of Stalin saying that he's doing it, obviously, but there are still many scholars, as I went over in my video on the topic, who have gone far beyond simple statements and looked at the actual actions and concluded that there was no special intent, thus that it was not genocide. Anyway, let's move on. Looking at the evidence shows that Stalin had a motive due to wanting to squash anti-Soviet Union demonstrations in Ukraine and browbeat their national identity away because he was severely concerned with Ukrainian nationalism. Now, I'd like to bring attention to this because this is the first time um, in this entire section responding to my video that he actually cites a source. And it's an absolutely terrible source because this is not actually a statement of fact, and it doesn't actually say what he's saying it does. This is rather just a citation of one academic's opinion on the matter. So, he said here that Stalin had a motive due to wanting to suppress anti-Soviet demonstrations and the Ukrainian national identity. Yet his source here is one scholar from 1983 simply stating that Stalin had planned it carefully and that it was intended from the start to subdue and Sovietize Ukraine. All of this is simple statements that are backed up by no evidence. It's this author, Warape, says this, therefore it's true. If you actually have specific evidence that Stalin intentionally caused the famine to attack anti-Soviet demonstrations and Ukrainian national identity, I would hope that you could provide it because it's something that has eluded scholars up until this point. But you haven't actually done that. What you've done is just cite what one scholar said 40 years ago. Talk about misusing sources. I can really tell that you're out of your comfort zone here and you're not really familiar with doing this at all. If you want to argue that, that Stalin intentionally inflicted the famine on Ukrainians against them for being Ukrainians, you're going to have to deal with all of the counter arguments on the matter, which ideally you would do not by responding to my video on it, which is itself a counter argument to a Wikipedia article, but by responding to the scholars who were cited in that Wikipedia article and whose work on the matter I thus cited in my video who think the Holodomor was not a genocide. You'd need to look at their work, go over it, explain just how and why you think it's wrong. Because if you don't do that, it simply means that you're intentionally avoiding the best counter arguments to your argument on the matter. In this case, we're talking about counter arguments that came much later than the source that you cited here, with evidence that was not available to this author when he wrote this. By the way, he died in 1989. So to go back and just cite this guy as some sort of authority who supposedly proved that Stalin inflicted the famine intentionally, specifically to kill Ukrainians, while ignoring the work of, what was it, five or six different scholars who I went over in my video on this topic, is just lying by omission. Yeah, there's not really much, much else to say about this bit. Very, very amateur. This is specifically why I think that YouTubers should probably avoid trying to seriously treat history because most of you are very much ill-equipped to do so. Because you're beginning with this preconceived conclusion that you're trying to back up, and it seems that the only way that you can back it up is by going back literally 40 years and citing nothing more than the say-so of a guy who wasn't even a historian who died in 1989. You know, I could respond to that with the say-so of actual historians from recent times who have worked with new evidence from the Soviet archives to pretty thoroughly debunk, at least until further notice, until better evidence becomes available, the idea that the famine was in intentionally inflicted on Ukrainians for being Ukrainians. Because that thesis was primarily based on speculation and on this idea that the evidence would eventually prove it. Basically, the lack of evidence enabled it. But now that there is much more counter-evidence to that notion, it kind of complicates things for them. Thus why people like this have to go back to sources from 40 years ago just confidently stating something without actually providing any evidence for it. And ripping food at gunpoint from people who are already starving to death is clearly an action that any person who does not suffer from severe mental disability can understand to be a death sentence. In other words, to claim that it wasn't a genocide by the UN definition, they are effectively saying, you can't prove that Stalin knew that locking down and stealing food from starving Ukrainians would kill them. Therefore, it wasn't a genocide. Now, this part of the video is citing a book by Anne Applebaum, who is a journalist for one, not a historian. And it is again making a pretty empty statement. In 1933, the cities knew the villages were dying. The leaders and administrators of the Communist Party and the government knew the villages were dying. The evidence was in front of everyone's eyes. Yes, they did know that. And what's the point that you're trying to make here? How does that knowledge prove that they were specifically trying to kill Ukrainians? Because villages in Kazakhstan were also dying. Villages in Russia were also dying. And don't worry, we're going to be dealing with Anne Applebaum later at the end of this segment, but not exactly a very good source to say the least, and there is a reason 
why people like this tend to stick with a pop history that does not actually engage with the academic counterarguments, because these sorts of pop history books, written by mostly by non-historians and not properly engaging with the actual counterarguments on the matter, do things in the only possible way in which the intentional genocide thesis can be sustained. Well, intentional genocide is kind of a dumb way to put things, because genocide is always intentional, but you know what I mean. Where she just straight up ignores all of the more recent scholarship on the matter that has completely upended this idea that it was an intentional genocide. And she chooses instead to basically cite things out of context, to cite things that have since been debunked. Basically, she rehashes Robert Conquest's work from the 1980s without dealing with any of the developments since then that would be inconvenient to her thesis. She does not deal with the work of Stephen Wheatcroft and Michael Davies. Oh, actually, she cites it, but she cites it when convenient to her, but she ignores the fact that their overall work was arguing against her thesis. That's very bad form in a book that is supposedly like some sort of serious um, treatment of the topic and stuff like that. And I'm going to provide an article by Mark B. Torger, an actual historian, actual subject matter expert later in the video, which shows this far beyond any reasonable doubt that her book is absolutely awful and should not be taken seriously by anyone who is examining this question with any level of honesty. He says here that they were ripping food at gunpoint from people who were clearly starving, but this citation on the screen doesn't actually say that. That's two citations that he's made in a row here that simply do not actually say what he says they do. They do not even remotely come close to backing up the claim that he's making. I just want to note that this guy literally cannot express himself by without putting like a thousand cringeworthy memes on the screen. And like, dude, you should, you need to change the person like ASAP. This is not healthy. Like, what else is there to say about this? This legitimately is the reasoning that is being used. I wish I was joking. Wait, how is that the reasoning that's being used? Who used that reasoning exactly? Because Michael Ellman, who I was summarizing in the part before this that he was supposedly responding to here, didn't use that reasoning. Nor was I even citing him in agreement with him. Because he actually agrees with you. He thinks the Holodomor was a genocide. Are you a bit lost? Did, did you get a bit confused? I would think that the fact that I was showing a source on the screen while clearly summarizing what someone else was saying would sort of clue you in to who was making the argument there. And I would think that you would maybe have the attention span to wait like five seconds when I get to the next part where Elman, as I showed, clearly argued his reasoning for why he thinks that it should be considered genocide, even if technically by a base reading of the UN definition, it might not be. So, dude, what the fuck are you even saying? Um, you should be embarrassed. I'm sorry. So, yeah, time to state the obvious. It doesn't matter how much work a scholar has put into studying Soviet history. If the reasoning behind their claim is demonstrably insane, they should not be taken seriously. How is the reasoning behind Elman's claim insane? I don't even, I don't even agree with him. He agrees with you, by the way. It's certainly not insane. He just says, well, you know, other scholars have argued that there is no spe specific evidence that Ukrainians were targeted for being Ukrainians. But personally, I think that there was sort of this level of neglect that perhaps under this legal precedent that was set in the Rwanda tribunals, it could be considered genocide. That is his argument. That's his reasoning. Where did you get this? What the fuck are you talking about? What is going on and what is this creepy ass AI clown? Why do the clowns have clowns in their chests, dude? You should be ashamed. I don't know what this video is, but you should be ashamed of it. This is hilarious. Thank you so much for making this. <laughs> well, it may be true that we indeed cannot magically go back in time and magically read Stalin's mind and therefore we cannot know by whatever magical means, by this unrealistic empiricist standard of evidence, for absolute 100% certainty, what the freaking hell Stalin was thinking. This same standard could be applied to any crime to claim it wasn't intentional, and it would also be impossible to prove. No, that's really not the case at all. The reason why it is argued by many scholars that the Holodomor was not a genocide is not solely because there are no specific statements of intent from Stalin or from other Soviet officials saying, we're doing this famine to kill the Ukrainians. It's because it was a wider Soviet famine, and the same measures that exacerbated it that were taken against Ukrainians were also taken against everyone else who was affected by it. And you clearly can't refute that because you're just sort of saying smugly that you're right without really backing it up or dealing with the counter arguments in any real way because you're just straw manning them completely. You actually haven't directly cited a single counter argument. You haven't cited any of the any of the scholars that I cited, which was what, five or six of them, who have argued that it wasn't a genocide. You haven't directly responded to any of that. Your only response here is just a complete misunderstanding of what Michael Ellman, who is a scholar who believes it was a genocide, was saying. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. I'm sorry. This is, this is far below my level.
and I shouldn't be responding to it, but sorry, it's easy content. Sorry, guys. And you're probably amused by this anyway. At some point, you have to recognize man as a rational actor and apply some basic common sense and some basic Occam's razor to what they most likely were intending, basic qualitative analysis. There are many arguments in the video that make this sort of analysis and come to the complete opposite conclusion that you think they should. You have ignored them completely to instead just talk smugly and put memes on the screen. Dude, your attention span is totally fucked. Turn off the social media. Get off 4chan. Read a book, an actual physical book. Think about the arguments within it. Engage with them. Because this is no replacement. What you're doing here is no replacement for that. Here's just some of the examples of the citations in my video that specifically talk about this. Stephen Kotkin. Mark B. Torger, who argued that the cause of the famine was mostly natural, therefore it could not have been an intentional genocide. Stephen Wheatcroft, who argued that new documents from the Soviet archives showed that the Soviet government carried out a large number of secret relief methods, yes, for Ukrainians, that rendered the previous conclusions that it was a genocide which originated in the 1980s, obsolete. Robert Davies and Stephen Wheatcroft also argued that the collectivization of farming which was carried out by Soviet officials was undertaken earnestly. They believed that what they were doing would work, and then it didn't. Stupid, yes, neglectful, absolutely. Intentional genocide. No, it's not the same thing. These are the sorts of arguments that you need to seriously deal with, and not just on the level of you, like, offhandedly smugly discounting them by saying, oh, the reasoning here is so bad, when you didn't even understand what they were saying. No, you need to specifically deal with the evidence that they are citing. You need to tell us why they're misinterpreting it, why it's wrong. You need to provide counter evidence. You can't just put some memes on the screen and talk smugly and that's all. God, man. Anyway, let's continue. Madam Panda seems to double down on the silly reasoning when he attempted to refute the book Bloodlands, completely hand-waving it away as debunked without really going over it at all. Isn't it interesting how this guy accuses me of hand-waving away this book, when his response to my video is less than 10 minutes long, or about 10 minutes long, something like that, and he's pretty much just him hand-waving away the entire video, completely ignoring all of the scholarship that I cited that contradicts what he wants to believe, and instead just cherry-picking and completely misunderstanding what Michael Ellman was saying. Funnily enough, he's also hand-waving away my argument for why Timothy Snyder's book Bloodlands is bad. He doesn't actually respond to it directly, nor even mention it. Pretty shitty form there. Perhaps it's because he's aware that he's not capable of actually responding to it, because what I said was just unequivocally true. My argument for why this book sucks was that one, it's essentially a rehash of arguments from the 1980s that have since been developed on, that have since been rendered obsolete by scholarship that is much more recent. And that happens to therefore contradict what this guy wants to believe. Probably why he didn't actually respond directly to my rebuttal to Bloodlands. And number two, and this is probably the worst part, Timothy Snyder in his book directly cites sources like Wheatcroft and Davies when convenient to him, while ignoring their overall arguments that rebut him. So it's a book that makes an argument that the Holodomor was an intentional genocide, while citing people who argued otherwise, the facts and figures that they cited and stuff like that, yet not actually even addressing their argument, not actually even mentioning that their counter-argument to him exists in his book, he just ignores it. And that's absolutely horrible form, just like how it's absolutely horrible form for this guy right here to ignore the counter arguments of the six or seven different scholars who I cited in my video on the topic who think it wasn't a genocide in a video that purports to be responding to my video. So just like Timothy Snyder, this guy clearly knows that those sources exist and he made a strategic decision not to respond to them. I wonder why. I don't wonder why. I know why he didn't, because he can't. I know why Snyder didn't respond to Wheatcroft and Davies, even though he cited them and demonstrated that he knows about their work, because he couldn't. It's really that simple. So I decided to read what Bloodlands had to say myself. One of the things it pointed out was the blacklist. This was a policy the Soviets put in place where communities in Ukraine that failed to meet their production quotas would then face multiplied quotas, specifically multiplied by 15 times, which of course they had no chance of meeting. And if they failed to meet this impossible standard, then the state took everything from them and barred them from receiving food deliveries, basically condemning them to death. Unless, again, you want to argue that Stalin didn't know that taking food from and multiplying quotas on starving Ukrainians would kill them. I actually really like this part because this is sort of a teaching moment for how you can sort of manipulate things to say what they're not actually saying. He cites as sort of proof from S Timothy Snyder's book that there was a genocide specifically directed and intentionally directed to kill Ukrainians. 
by the fact that collective farms that failed to meet grain targets were required immediately to surrender 15 times the amount of grain that was normally due in a whole month. But do you see an issue with this? It's all collective farms. It's not just Ukrainian collective farms, it's all of them. In all collective farms in the, Soviet, in the Soviet Union, this was a requirement. And guess what? We actually have specific facts and figures that tell us how many farms ended up being blacklisted in the different regions of the Soviet Union. So let's look at the actual impact of Ukraine of this blacklisting policy. And we can do this pretty easily because Anne Applebaum, who our friend here provingly cites later on as some sort of amazing authority on, on the famine, engaged in the same deception that Timothy Snyder did here by bringing up the blacklisting policy without mentioning the fact that it was Soviet Union wide and without actually mentioning the fact that we have specific figures for how many farms were actually blacklisted in Ukraine. That is 400 out of 23,000. So this was clearly nowhere near as impactful of a policy as Snyder, as Applebaum, or as this guy claims. Nor was it discriminatory as they also like to imply. And do you know how we know how many collective farms ended up being blacklisted in Ukraine? Soviet archives. New evidence that came out after the theses from the 80s of genocide were formed that contradicted them. This is why it's very important to not just read books that rehash arguments from the 80s. This is why it's important to read new scholarship that argues against those theses based on new information. Because one part of the genocide argument from the 80s originally made by Robert Conquest was this. There were farms that were blacklisted in Ukraine for not producing or, or giving enough grain, blah, blah, blah. Then the Soviet archives opened up. Historians were able to look at the information within them. And they were able to see that the blacklisting policy, for one, was actually not discriminatory against Ukrainians. And for two, it only affected a very small minority of farms anyway. And this is the only thing that this guy cites from Timothy Snyder's book. He's like, oh, I actually went and read this book. I don't believe you read it at all. I think you just went and looked for a specific part of it. And anyway, the reason why I didn't respond to this specific part of this book is because I was not responding to this book. I was not engaging in a thorough debunking of this book. I explained why it was bad, and I explained why I thought it wasn't a good inclusion in the Wikipedia article. Or I think actually I said, I can understand why it's in the Wikipedia article, though I don't think it's a very good source, something like that. But I was responding to the Wikipedia article, right? I was explaining why this isn't a great source to be used and why its arguments aren't very good and how it has to dishonestly avoid the counter arguments in order to function at all, how it has to rehash arguments from the 80s while dishonestly presenting talking points exactly like this one, exactly like this blacklist talking point, which have since been thoroughly shown to really not have been nearly as impactful as they were previously said to be. So yeah, um, I, I believe the kids would call this one a huge L for my friend here. Now, to Bad and Panda's credit, he does at least recognize that Stalin's policies were disastrous and that the actions within the Soviet government were irresponsible. And thus the fault for at least some of the deaths in the famine was indeed Stalin's fault. Bad and Panda's mainly just arguing against it being intentional. There are other tankies out there who are much more pro-Stalinist than him that try to make absurd arguments that Stalin did nothing wrong and that the famine was caused entirely by disease or other natural causes, despite the lack of solid evidence for this claim and in spite of all the research that has been done into Stalin's actions during this time period that heavily details all the terrible things that he did. The thing is there is actual solid evidence for the natural cause thesis and you know that because I cited Mark B. Torger's work on the topic in my video. So again you're just ignoring the counter evidence and just confidently stating something with a smug tone and apparently that's supposed to be a replacement for actual analysis of any type. Oof. Not, not leaving a good impression here, my friend. So credit does have to be given to Bad and Panda for not being as crazy as some of the other tankies. But for the most part, all this video really boils down to is examining the sources used in the 2022 version of the Wikipedia article on the Holodomor genocide question, and pointing out how the sources that stand against the idea that the Holodomor was a genocide tend to have more effort behind them and be more fleshed out than the sources claiming it was, and claiming that the latest research actually claims that it was not a genocide, based on course on data from Soviet archives claiming it wasn't, and that all the sources claiming that it was a genocide are supposedly based on outdated information. In other words, it's an empiricist analysis with almost no rationality applied to it. So he just kind of came out and said right there that he thinks that he can just sort of avoid evidence and like argue for what he believes based on nothing but his own epic rational, rational brain. Um, I don't think that's how this works. You kind of do need to analyze, analyze the evidence. And I, I can guarantee you, my friend, that a lot of um, 
rational thinking goes into this analysis of the evidence. Um, but I haven't really seen a lot of rational thinking from you, given the fact that the very first thing you did was kind of mischaracterize and argue against a guy who agrees with you. Not to mention that you're here talking about more recent scholarship and all of this stuff. I cited like six or seven different more recent works in my video. You're just ignoring them and you're being like, hey, well, what about this other book by Anne Applebaum? Now, aside from the rational problems I pointed out, there's an additional problem with this, which is that there actually are books out there that take a closer look at the evidence and conclude it was a genocide that are relatively recent. For instance, one of the sources for my video that you're watching right now is the book Red Famine by Anne Applebaum in 2017, which heavily documents how the genocide was carried out, why it was carried out, and how Soviet propaganda mills covered it up. Well, let's talk about Anne Applebaum. Anne Applebaum is not a historian. Anne Applebaum is a journalist. What is her book? It's a rehash of Robert Conquest, the same Robert Conquest who has since disavowed his previous arguments after seeing new information. There is a really good article by an actual real historian, one who, as I went over in my original video, I don't particularly agree with, but he is very much an expert on this subject matter. He's very familiar with the sources, he's very familiar with the other scholarship, so his assessment of her work is extremely good and extremely valuable. But don't take my word for it, you can read his article yourself. Mark B. Torga wrote an extremely good critique of Anne Applebaum's absolutely horrible book, which is not a scholarly work. It's, as I said earlier about Bloodlands, it's even, it's way worse than Bloodlands, by the way. It specifically avoids the actual more recent scholarship on the matter while citing the recent scholarship on the matter when it's convenient for her. It ignores their arguments, it ignores the counter arguments, it ignores the counter evidence, counter evidence that her citations show that, that she knows exists to essentially make a, po a politically motivated polemic argument. And that is why it is a terrible source. And this is essentially the argument, though in much more detail with specific, very specific examples, dozens of them, that Mark B. Torga makes to essentially completely rubbish and destroy this book. I could just sort of read this whole thing in full, but it's quite long, so I will link it in the description so you guys can go and read it yourself. One specifically relevant part that is relevant to the thing that we just talked about with the blacklisting of collective farms is this part here, where Torga says, Applebaum describes the blacklisting policy, which denied a kolkhoz or village access to trade, forced them to pay debts early, and sometimes seized other possessions as a, maize as a main cause of the famine. Yet her own sources show that in December, at the peak of the campaign, only 400 Kolkhozi were blacklisted. Her sources agree that blacklisting could not and did not stop trade. The Ukrainian government also removed villages from the blacklist if they met most of the procurement quota. Applebaum never mentions these points. Based on this evidence, it is difficult to accept Applebaum's claims that blacklisting was a major cause of famine mortality. So this is another example of how people who argue for the genocide thesis tend to ignore or play up things like this. Obviously, when only 400 collective farms were blacklisted out of 23,000 in Ukraine total, we're not talking about a measure that specifically targeted Ukrainians, nor are we talking about a measure that could have possibly on its own been a cause of the famine. Was it unjust or bad or whatever? Maybe, sure. But is it evidence of some intentional genocide targeted at Ukrainians? Certainly not. In fact, this wider context that shows that only about 3% of the collective farms ended up being blacklisted in Ukraine shows that it was quite a selective measure. One that is clearly being played up to be far more bigger and impactful and targeted than it really was by people who nonetheless have clearly read these sources, they've seen these numbers, yet have nonetheless decided to dishonestly present this information by removing this context in their own work such as Anne Applebaum, such as Timothy Snyder, who did the exact same thing in the passage that my friend here cited to supposedly debunk me. Interestingly, this one is completely missing from the Wikipedia article. Hmm, it's almost as if Wikipedia's source requirements are actually biased against more right-leaning sources. Nah, that couldn't be. So I guess in a fun M. Night Shyamalan twist, he's entirely correct that the Wikipedia article on the Holodomor genocide is biased, just for the opposite reason he seems to think that it is. The reason why Anne Applebaum's book isn't on the Wikipedia page, at least I would hope, is because she's not an academic. It would make no sense to include a polemic by a journalist that is clearly very shoddy scholarship, as that bit that I just went over alone shows, but as Mark B. Torga shows very thoroughly in his review, in an article summarizing academic opinions on the matter. 
And buddy, if you think the New York Times is left wing, I don't even know what to say to you. You've got, you've got some problems going on there in the brain of yours. So that's the end of the part of his video that deals with my... So that's the end of the part of his video that deals with my video. His video is less than half the duration of mine and the part of his video that specifically deals with my video is 10 minutes long um my video is more than an hour by the way so so very clearly doing what he accused me of doing i was clearly the one who was being thorough here while he was being incredibly cherry picky and completely completely ignoring all of the work of the scholars that i brought up that i summarized that very inconveniently contradict the narrative that he wants to push here and i mean half of those 10 minutes is dedicated to him debunking um a position that i never expressed and the person whose opinion that I was summarizing, Michael Elman, certainly never expressed either. So we're not exactly dealing with the best of the best here, though. Perhaps on YouTube, this is what counts for um, some sort of like knowledge lord, who undoubtedly has, a, has an adoring fan base who considers him to be some sort of intellectual. Look, I'm sorry for the tone that I took in this video. I, I might be a bit dismissive, I might be a bit of an asshole, but honestly, I have no patience for people who seem to think that just by putting on a smug voice and putting memes on the screen, while completely ignoring all of the contradictory information of the video that you purport to be responding to set forth, that it makes you some sort of intellectual or whatever, that it, may, that it makes you like some sort of enlightened being. YouTube history just sucks, man. People who claim to be doing history on YouTube suck. People who claim to be doing politics on YouTube suck. If this is the best you guys have got, if this is the best response that you can do, yeah, just keep it to yourselves next time, please. I think this is this is so bad that it warrants me just plain being mean. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. It's too bad. I just wanted to make a quick response to this because I'm so excited to have someone respond to me. But I think in the end, just ended up being frustrating. Not because like he totally owed me or anything, just because it's disappointing disappointing that this is really the best that this is really the best that they've got against me this is the best you can throw at me he, he spent five minutes of the video arguing like mischaracterizing the argument of a guy who agrees with him and then the rest of the video was him just talking about how great timothy snyder and ann applebaum are without actually dealing with my argument as to why they aren't particularly great like he didn't respond to me directly i think no he didn't respond to me directly he didn't respond directly to a single thing that i said even once, aside from the bit about Australia, which was him just completely misunderstanding what I was even saying. So, yeah. Whew. Anyway, see ya.